Eh <laughs> sì. <laughs> Guess we wait for the Australians. Battling storm, terrible timing. Terrible. What a waste of 2,000 points. Battling storm. What are you doing here, battling storm? I was in the wrong class. Anyway, I hope everything's good with you. Okay, might as well start. Okay, so uh, I'll wait for the Australians to show up. Uh, yeah. Specifically, LBW, uh, other usual suspects. 
Mm, let's see. Everything. Upper dimension. Mm. Bad. It's like both, yeah. Battling Storm. It's like both. It's a seminar. Yes, the late one, 314. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, if it derails, I'll have to... Um, uh, maybe on Discord or something. Go ahead. How many math books do I own? Very few. Very few. Um, there's like a couple in there. And then I have a couple in another bookshelf in Oregon. Don't ask why. But not, not that many. Oh, <laughs> yeah, 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 that's also true, Mega. <laughs> no, but I, I actually don't, uh, this is like the first time, I've, actually, this semester in Galois Theory, and this class is the first time in a long time that I'm actually reading a textbook. It feels very strange to me, because I've been in a different mode of existence since um, back then. If it's a refreshing feeling. Yeah, but when you read a paper, it's a different act. Okay, uh, when you're refereeing a paper, you actually read it carefully, in principle. But when you're reading a paper, you're skimming it for crucial information. Like, uh, but this is different. We're going, we're going, Mostly, I might jumble the order of, of some stuff because I want to bring some interesting stuff first and then do some boring stuff after, but we're mostly just somewhere around page... What is it? Uh, page... What would you say? Yeah. Are there even pages in this uh, online textbook? 30? 30 30-ish? Thirty-ish. All right, so everyone, everyone seems to be here. Smash time. You read papers? You read them like completely, like a, like a newspaper? I don't know. Late one. I don't know. Probably like ten. Okay, ready? Let's go. Here we go. So today I want to talk about the Chow group. Just to, just to put it in your in front of your face once again. Practice the definition. Um, understand the individual pieces of the definition. Just so... Because it's the main character. In the whole story. Um, then I'll talk about some definitions. Notions of transversality. Let's flex some of our geometry muscles. Um, then I'll tell you the miracle fact of this world, which is that the Chow ring exists when X is a smooth variety. There's a ring structure on this. Right now, what we have is a group of cycles mod rational equivalents. And then we'll move to trying to compute a of x for easy varieties. Serious members of the seminar. Immediate goal, concrete goal. No, uh, how many chow rings do you know? Okay, we're gonna do a very stupid, silly example. Instructive though. Um, and then we'll move to a more advanced one. Okay, z, do you know a chow ring of a point? W wonderful. That's fantastic. It's a good start. 
How about a chow ring of two points? Think about it. Try it. Try it. Try the definition out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We're gonna go. We'll just... Uh, I'm a very examples-oriented person, so... Um, how many of these things do you know? It's a infinite ex uh, homework exercise. Okay? Alright. And talk about it amongst yourselves on Discord. Uh, and um, have fun with it. Okay, so here's a picture of rational equivalence, cartoon. You've got an interpolator variety, variety, irreducible, closed subset of the product P1 cross X. That thing serves as a homotopy total space. You call one fiber of it rationally equivalent to another fiber. And now if a fiber is non-reduced, has some multiplicities, which we'll learn how to calculate next week. We'll do a commutative algebra day on how to calculate a multiplicity, what that means. But uh, if you know how to do that, then you declare one fiber counted with multiplicity as a cycle, rationally equivalent to another fiber. So in this picture, I'm trying to depict C, this curve, or this sub-variety of X, the big yellow circle, as rationally equivalent to this plus this. And implicitly I'm saying that they are multiplicity one little components. That's the cartoon of rational equivalence. Is A of X, Y? No, no, LBW, the chow ring of a product a chow ring of a product can be one of the most mysterious objects in the whole universe. I'm not joking. If you take, for example, two random smooth curves, I'm just going to say this. No one has any idea what the chow ring of that is. The product. Okay? However, when you take the product of something with something very innocent and nice, like a projective space, or a Grassmannian, or an affine space, then you can, you have a nice, um, let's call it tensor product type Kunith formula for the Chow ring. Okay, so the Chow ring, more complicated, carries more information than, say, just cohomology ring from just topology and DW complexes and so, where you have a Kunith formula. There's no Kunith formula. And chow ring of a product, beautiful question. Deep, very hard. No one has any techniques. I mean, I'm very arrogant, but uh, I've, been, I've been checking the archive, nothing, nothing good yet. Okay, fantastic. Good question. All right, so here we go. Chow groups, what was chow groups? I'll just zip through it. Chow group. So remember, you have X, a variety. Okay. Hey, can X be reducible? Can it be a union of two varieties? Yes, yes, yes. Forget about the generalizations. It's a, yes, just for simplicity, variety. Okay. For this gr chow groups, does X have to be smooth? No. Chow group. You fix a dimension, K, that you're interested in. The dimension K anatomy of this variety. You take dimension K subvarieties. You slap some coefficients in front of them. You do formal sums and differences. You get the top numerator abelian group, three. Then you mod out by a subgroup called rational equivalences, where this Interpolator variety is k plus one dimensional, so that fibers are k dimensional. X means reduced and irreducible. Yes, variety means reduced and irreducible. Fantastic, exactly that. All right, over an algebra, uh, algebraically closed field, uh, Luo. Before you ask, uh, the most geometric setting. It's already interesting. Okay, good. All right. 
So there you go. You do that. Now, how on earth do you actually compute it? In sp very concrete examples, you can produce enough rational equivalences to get a handle on the thing. And in general, what is a child group of a random variety? Spend your whole life studying that for a specific variety. For example, there are these things called abelian varieties. Many people have thought about the question, what does chow zero, a sub zero of that look like? Just the zero cycles. Beautiful question. Okay, wonderful thing. One way of saying it is that rational equivalence is a very um, restrictive homotopy equivalence type uh, homology type theory, rational equivalence. Very restrictive, but that yields beautiful investigation, on the other hand. More varieties of answers, more wonderful garden. Okay, good. Then you take the direct sum of all these, and that's what we call the total chow group. Okay, but it's just, you're just talking about individual chow groups uh, separated by commas. Okay, so that's what it is. And where is it going to come up? Okay, where, where are we going with this? Um, let me not say that yet. Let's just, uh, I'll say it at uh, stage three. Let me try to give a good lecture this time. Okay, so this is the uh, beginning of our fundamental object of interest in this seminar. Okay, so what was I going to say about this? Yes, I was just going to tell you what, what the definition was one more time. Um, everyone clear? Isn't rational equivalence just an algebraic ver version of cobordism? Yeah, if you'd like to put, uh, yeah, sure. Um, yeah. I mean, there's, the problem is algebraic version. Uh, you could have chosen any, like, what if you choose an arbitrary curve here? Then you get the concept of numerical uh, equivalence. Or algebraic, sorry, algebraic equivalence, rather than rational equivalence. I said the wrong thing. Algebraic equivalence would put an arbitrary smooth curve down there. So, like, I don't know if that if that makes it clearer for you, then that's great. That's when two people are bored together. That's right, cobordism. Good, good chat. Very high level chat. That's very good. Okay, so there you go. Uh, that's the thing. Um, how many of these do we know? Not very many, uh, so we're going to have to work on that. So next, though, I want to talk about some uh, geometric notions, some language. <laughs> very good, yeah. Okay, debate that in the chat. It's important. Okay. Transversality. There will be two notions of transversality. So we will use the word transversality in two ways, okay? With two different adjectives. Here's the situation. You have X, and for us always, X is gonna be pure dimensional. It's a variety, okay? It's a variety. So I don't even want to say pure dimensional. Okay, there, eh, variety. And in it, we have two sub varieties, sub varieties, okay? Closed subsets. Okay? Now, we were interested in their intersection. And now here's a, here's a dream type of situation that one could hope is the case in any given enumerative problem, right? So the dream is that A intersect B has the right dimension. And I'll tell you exactly what having the right dimension is. It means having the right codimension. 
That's a very deep statement. But what does it mean to have the right co-dimension? Easier to say the co-dimension one than the dimension. So let's say having the right co-dimension. Answer is that if the co-dimension of A intersect B is equal to the co-dimension of A plus the co-dimension of B. Okay, that's what it means for A intersect B to have the right co-dimension. Now, hold on. What do we mean by co-dimension? Okay, what we mean here is that every component of A intersect B have this co-dimension. Because just because you have two irreducible varieties doesn't mean that when you intersect them, it stays irreducible. So I mean every component. Okay, good, good, good. Awesome. Uh, Luo, what, what, a, what an amazing contribution. Thank you. That's, <laughs> that's better. Thanks, Mega. Thanks for that reference. I'll look into that. Probably not, but yeah, awesome. Okay, so that's what we'll call dimensional transversality. So if this is the case, if this dream is true, why is it a dream? It's because think about linear algebra. Make A and B. In fact, folks, think about linear algebra in all of this dimension theory. Whenever people are saying expected dimension this, what do you expect the dimension to be of the intersection, blah, blah, blah. Think linear algebra. It will guide you through that, uh, that whole thing, okay? In linear algebra, you'd agree with this, okay? There you go. If, if two linear spaces didn't meet like this, mm, you just should have wiggled one a little bit and then it'll, it'll straighten itself out. This is called... When, when this situation holds, we say A and B have... Okay, let me, let, me, let, me, let me read it, okay? This means A and B... Let me click the right page here. Meet tra dimensionally tra transversely. You know, I prefer the language dimensionally properly, but... They decided, you know what, proper is used too much. And so they decided to say dimensionally. No, they intersect. No. Do you guys see it? Do you guys see it? I, I'm not, I can't see it for some reason. Where is it? How do you say it? I, I just want to know which order they want me to say the words in. It's going to have dimension and transverse. So, uh, there it is. There it is. It, um, no, that's not, that's not where it is. Dimensionally transverse. Okay. We say A and B meet in a dim dimensionally transverse way. Let me give you a non-example. Yeah, 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 I am. I'm 3264. Any help would be appreciated. Uh, I, we're in chapter one, around page 30, and but I, I sort of jumble things uh, based on uh, my lack of uh, uh, discipline. Okay, what? You, you get the point, yeah? The correct co-dimension. Look, here's a non-example. P3 is large, big, big circle. There's A, one line, and B, another line, and suppose they meet. No, no, no. They were not supposed to meet because the co-dimension of A is 2, the co-dimension of B is 2, so the intersection, if they met 
trans uh, dimensionally correctly transversely is four which means empty so they shouldn't meet if they're to be dimensionally transverse just in case you were wondering okay um so this is p3 Good. p3 is a very it's a larger circle yes because p2 is a circle and p4 is a big cir bigger circle than p3 okay and all lines are somewhat slightly curved and cartoony very important to understand this uh basic terminology okay a line and a and a and and, and a cubic surface meeting in p3 at uh, finitely many points dimensionally transverse a line meeting cubic surface tangentially with non-reduced scheme but finite still dimensionally transverse sad uh, use of transverse because you might have a different notion of transverse which I'll get to right now okay and here's the next one um, we say A and B meet generically transversely or okay let me do a first definition meet transversely at a point at a point p in their intersection okay if okay first of all uh, just uh, to clear up any um, gnarly situations, most of our situations will not have this clause necessary, but uh, P3 is A3 minus uh, A3 plus points at infinity. Somewhat round. <laughs> Actually, the roundness is, yeah. Because P1 cross P1 is a square. I, did, I don't know if you knew that. Roundness is kind of more about the homogeneity of the thing. It's kind of a big group of there's homogeneous. Anyway, okay. So um, uh, you can debate that in the chat as well. So uh, these meet transversely at a point P in the intersection if um, let me put it in parenthetical. P is a smooth point of X. or x is smooth at p and um, the tangent spaces add up to the full tangent space span I don't know how the book is going to write it um, yeah the span okay good Okay, I, I am not insane. Okay, uh, this is, as the book points out, this is also written um, like in linear algebra. Linear algebra expectation is holding, which is that the co-dimension, co-dimension viewed as a, the ambient vector space is the tangent space of the whole variety. The co-dimension of this subspace plus the co-dimension of this subspace is correct i mean is the co-dimension of this subspace there we go okay these are the same uh two two ideas Definitely round, yeah. <laughs> Definitely round. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um. Fantastic. Okay, so this is what it means to be dimensionally transverse. Let me draw a picture of uh, two um, surfaces meeting 
dimension uh, see this is why meeting transversely at a given point okay not dimensionally transverse but uh, okay let me draw two surfaces ready um okay i'm, I'm gonna try to draw this actually i can do it i think i can do it look uh surface is yellow it's just like it's like an a3 you've got like parabola cross an axis that's your first surface second surface I'm just making these up on the spot folks it's doesn't you can you should make your own at, at home grow your own um, examples again the uh, ambient uh, variety X is a3 say I don't care and a3 is a box right these two's um, a and B They meet dimensionally transversely Okay, but not transversely at any one of the points in their intersection Because the tangent plane of a is uh, This one and the tangent plane of B is this one. Now verify that those two don't span all of X or their individual codimensions aren't compiling down to the codimension of the, the two spaces aren't intersecting. The two vector spaces aren't intersecting correctly. Okay, so that's... Um, non-transverse intersection at a, at a given point. Okay, last bit of language. We say A and B intersect generically transversely. If Their intersection is transverse, according to tangent spaces, for a dense set, and in, in, uh, in gen, uh, because of upper semi-continuity theorems, type theorem, um, it's actually going to be an open subset an open dense dense open set in the intersection sub variety so you look at that inter, uh, intersection sub scheme okay so so you look at that sub scheme it, ha it could have many components right in each one you ask is most of the points in that intersection part is is a and b meeting Transversely according to tangent spaces. How about this other component? Are they meeting transversely most of for most of the points on that component? Etc. If the answer is yes, we say that A and B meet generically transversely. Um, period. Okay, so here's an example of um, A and B not meeting generically transversely. Because all along that line, they're not meeting transversely. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. AC, exactly. All right, so it's failing the expected. You're not knocking down the dimension as much as you could have when you intersected those spaces. Okay, awesome. Um, is this is this okay with everyone this language dimensionally correct 
dimensionally transverse. Um, transverse at a given point. That's the two tangent spaces are going in as independent directions as they can afford in the ambient space. Generically transverse means on each irreducible piece of our intersection, the two sub varieties are meeting most of the time transversely. Okay, fantastic. To be clear, generic transversality means um, transverse on a dense open set of the intersection, 100%. Dense open, not just an open. Difference between dense open and open is in the possibility that something is reducible. Yeah. Good. So every individual chunk, you check transversality for most of it at the generic point you'd like. Anyway, okay. So now, um, then you extend this notion to cycles. You extend, you extend uh, Z linearly, yeah? What does it mean for some cycle to be generically transverse to another cycle? These are, the individual varieties are assumed, these are varieties and these are multiplic, these are in coefficients, just formally adding, subtracting. These intersect they intersect dimensionally, correctly, transversely. If AI and BJ intersect that way for all pairs. Same with uh, all the other transversalities. Yes, yes. In a, when someone writes a good question, when someone writes a cycle, okay? Typically when someone writes a cycle, it's pr typically a K cycle, like a dimension has been specified. Good. Yeah. So, and that's how it'll be every time. Uh, I don't think it's common to, to write a cycle that has mixed dimensions in it. Good. Um, exactly. Okay. So the, all the notions you extend to cycles in a, in a simple way. All right. Good. Okay. Um, Okay, and then uh, if you have more than two sub-varieties, you have A, B, C, D, what does it mean for their four-way intersection to be generically this, that, everything? It just means, uh, you know, you've got these co-dimension sums. You're just going to have more terms, and you ask that that be true. Okay, let's just add, uh, extend that <laughs> linearly for more intersections. Good. Yeah, basically megalomorph, that's basically how it goes. It's, uh, however, there will be times when we write out sums in the chow ring that have terms of different um, dimensions. They will be... For example, things called things like the um, total churn class of a vector bundle will have individual graded pieces, and then you put plus signs between them. Um, so there will be times when we do that, but it's kind of rare. And you 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 parse it like degree by degree uh, every time you see an entity in the Chow ring. Yeah. Okay. So now we come to what I want to call emphasize. The miracle of the Chow Ring, okay? Uh, I want to emphasize something and so that you understand that there's something really difficult, deep, and um, hundreds of years of work uh, going on here. I want to just say that to you, that it's not obvious that there's, there's, there's a thing that I'm about to tell you about. Okay. So the miracle of the existence of the Chow Ring. Okay, if you're following in the book, it is Theorem Definition 1.5. And it's not just, a, it's, 
it is not just a theorem. Okay, it's a okay. The theorem definition. 1.5. If X is a smooth quasi-projective variety. So now we're going to need that smoothness assumption. Very important. We'll see examples where we'll convince ourselves that smoothness is, is such a great thing. But not today, because we're going to focus on silly examples today. If X is a smooth quasi-projective variety. And you can extend it to proper if, if, you're, if you want it, but smooth quasi-projective variety. But the smoothness is absolutely needed. Then there is a unique product structure on this Chow group. But that's not the end of the sentence. Uh, <laughs> that's not the end of the sentence. There's a unique product structure Satisfying this condition. If two subvarieties of X meet generically transversely, so correct codimension. No, meet, um, okay, generically transverse includes, by the way, um, yeah, generic transverse, uh, includes dimensionally transverse. Wait, is that clear to, uh, yeah. Yes, 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 because I, I think I asked, okay, okay. Okay, P has to be a smooth point of X, A and B. Okay, forget that detail right now. No, no, no. If two subvarieties meet transversely, generically transversely, forget my hiccup. Yes, exactly, Megalomorph. Exactly that. Uh, write that down, everybody. If two subvarieties meet generically transversely, then. This product structure it's what it outputs okay what it outputs is what you think it outputs if you are in a class called intersection theory okay the class means the class in the appropriate graded uh cycle class group the um the chunk of the the eighth chow group the correct one yeah if a is codimension two b is codimension three then this is in codimension five this is a sub variety it's not quite a sub variety this a intersect b but it is a each of its components has a multiplicity it turns out to be one but you add the sort of formal combination of those components with their uh, multiplicity one in this case. All right. <laughs> no, no, no. The class is not graded. Uh, uh, don't worry. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's not graded. Good one. Okay. So uh, this is this is interesting. It's saying that you can upgrade the naive. 
what you would naively want to have happen if you're trying to make intersections of subvarieties look like multiplication in a ring. Oh, you know what? A and B's multiplication? I'll make it A intersect B. Okay. That dream for transverse intersections is one piece of actually a, a legitimate product structure. You know, that has a... Uh, uh, obeys all those axioms about rings. I forgot them. Okay. No, the boxing. <laughs> okay. No, there's no boxing. There's not. There's no boxing. And this chat. Okay. So it makes uh, this thing into a commutative associative. Uh, graded uh, ring um, and it's called the chow ring um, so ax becomes a ring called the chow ring Okay, Ark. Have fun. Uh, go ahead and go to sleep. Okay. So, let's look at this. Remember, there's equivalence classes. Mod rational equivalence. You need to read that in this, uh, in this formula. If you, if you change A rationally to another cycle with a, with a bubble, and you change B with another soap bubble to a different rational equivalence cycle, the intersections will also move. Right? The components of the intersections will move. But by some miracle, there is a systematic way of saying that when you take the classes, you get one particular linear equivalence class as an answer, a well-defined one particular equivalence class. That's the content of this uh, statement. All right. Hey, uh, Cosmic Stardom, welcome. Wait, oh, we got, we got raided? Oh, well, isn't that great? Is it, isn't that great? Thank you, Math Girl, for showing up and uh, totally Ruining the seminar. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Um, please have a seat. We are intersecting subvarieties in um, mostly a smooth ambient variety because the intersection operation, if dimensionally transverse, underlies a ring structure on the Chow group. That is a miracle. That is a gift from nature. And it was efforts of hundreds of years of algebraic geometry to actually pin this thing down, to, 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 to know that it exists. I think Fulton in 1984 is, is credited to finally have written down how exactly uh, this works, that there, that there is this dream ring structure on um, on the Chow group of a smooth projective, eh, quasi-projective algebraic variety. Okay, so, um, okay. So, what was I supposed to say? Yes, the, I, I told you the miracle that there's a ring structure that reflects in the generic transversality case, intersection of subvarieties as the product structure in the ring. And it's on equivalence classes, rational equivalence classes. Let me go back to the cartoon depiction of how an enumerative problem is solved. Remember I said there were like four steps? Obviously that's not a real thing. But in one of the steps, what happened was you had various cycles or subvarieties that emerged from the problem, yeah? 
twisted cubics tangent to a given um, thing. Okay, whatever. The math problem, it's like a word problem. The hard part, you got to boil it down. Yeah, you got it down to intersecting some sub-varieties in some massive variety X. That was the parameter space. It was called P. So, <laughs> you're interested... So the thing you, you really hope for is that the intersection is dimensionally transverse. That your intersection of these cycles that came out of the math problem is dimensionally transverse. That's something you gotta wish for and analyze in each particular case. Once you verify that, and if that intersection happens to be zero dimensional, a bunch of points with multiplicities, then you plug that into the chow ring. And I know some of you must have had the question. Why is that fruitful? Why is plugging into the chow ring any good if I could... Why not work with the raw variety itself? Let me look at it with a microscope. It's right there. What's the use of passing to the chow ring? It's because the, the ring structure survives rational equivalence. And so if your x1 was very complicated... Oh, some twisted variety. Very complicated, very beautiful, twisted, very hard to imagine. However, if you knew it was rationally equivalent to a union of very simple varieties. Then you can replace x1 with the sum of those varieties in this product. And so on. And then expand, use associativity, distributive law, or FOIL. But each of these pieces are two simple varieties intersecting. That's the reason why you plug in to the chow ring at the end. You don't analyze your math problem, your two very complicated curves meeting in P2. No, you trade them away for a union of lines. And the, the miracle is that you get an answer which is rationally equivalent to the previous answer. If Dimensional intersection, blah, 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 blah. Dimensionally proper intersections all along. Okay? That is the magic of the story. That's what steps three and the passage from step three to step four, why it's cool, why it's useful. Okay? Awesome. Yes, exactly. Or exactly, AC. You reduce the intersection of two complicated varieties that you're having a very hard time understanding. If you know enough to say that, well, I, what I do know is this variety, sub-variety, happens to be rationally equivalent to the union of, let's just say, a bunch of planes. The plane doesn't make any sense in a random variety, as you know. But whatever, yeah? Then x1 is a sum of planes. By the way, all planes are rationally equivalent to each other of the same dimension in projective space. Doesn't matter. You get a sum of simpler ones. And so you trade off x1 times x2 for like foiling. But they're all simple. Now, s22 cap the Veronese would be zero. Because the ambient space is five-dimensional, and so two surfaces, if they meet, it, when they when they meet dimensionally correctly, would be a negative one. Should be empty. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so if you took the class of S two two and the class of the Veronese surface, and you plug those into the Chow ring, it will say zero. Even if. Physically, you had witnessed two surfaces that were intersecting. It's that that doesn't, it's not respecting the grading. It's not 
Uh, it's not actually... It's not contradicting the theorem definition. If they meet generically transversely, then the intersection product is the class of the intersection. Um, megalomorph, it's true if your group G is an algebraic group. That's because algebraic groups are rational by a difficult theorem in the theory of algebra, uh, linear algebra, linear algebraic groups. Linear algebraic groups, not, not random algebraic group. If you have a linear algebraic group, there's a theorem that says that, I think it's due to Borel, maybe. Probably, it's always safe to say it's Borel. That they're actually um, rational varieties. They're made out of big chunks of like affine spaces and um, C stars or toruses, tori. And those have lots of P1 type curves or open subsets of P1 that you can use to interpolate. Does that make sense, megalomorph? So it's true for a linear algebraic group G. Um, good. Okay. W wonderful, wonderful. So that was what I had to do in step three. And now step four. Step four, okay? In step four, I'm going to do uh, the first pass at a computation. And then... Oh, no, no. So... Um, yeah, don't worry about it, Megalomorph. Um, I'll, be, I'll, I'll talk about it right afterwards. I'll talk about it right afterwards. Okay, so AX. Uh, for easy varieties, start the game. Everybody has to start their own personal Pokemon collection, you know? How many Chow Rings do you know? All of my students, uh, I, I ask. They, they know, a couple of them that are here. They know that I like to ask the question, how many blanks do you know? Because by collecting more examples, you start to see the wonder, the big, big ass garden that's here for us to play in. Okay, how many chow rings do you know? How many chow rings do you know? How many line bundles do you know? The, this question keeps going. How many curves do you know? How many surfaces okay let's go so big as guardian <laughs> hey psych queen hey everyone did you know psych queen streams why am i doing shout outs in the middle of the seminar okay psych, psych queen here's here's your shout out there you go okay so what is the chow ring of affine space. Okay, I'll tell you. It's extremely boring. That's right, AC. But AC, come on, 50-50 uh, guess, okay? Where is that Z? In what graded, what dimension is that Z supported in? Come on, everyone hope that he gets it. Come on. Is it zero cycles? N, that's right. Fundamental class, right? It's, it's, it's only got its fundamental class and of course multiples of it. Absolutely, exactly right. Only its fundamental class. That's right. And Baldur, exactly. Okay, now why? Why is that true? Okay, I have five minutes left. I'm gonna tell you the geometric reason why that's true. And then 
you can and then you can read about it. I don't want to waste too much time on this example, but because the geometry explains it uh, intuitively, uh, it captures an intuitive notion way better than than writing it all out in equations and stuff. But you can see it on page page. What is this page? Thirty nine. Okay, I want you to read this. Uh, on, I'm not going to cover it Monday. This is assigned homework. Read page thirty nine at least. Okay, ready? Here's why. Here's why. Suppose you have any subvariety of affine space. Some subvariety. This is a one cycle. Yeah? All right, it's an affine space. I don't know, A3 or something. Okay, so the first thing you do, use a little bit of affine translation to make sure that the variety is not hitting the origin. That You don't have to do this. You can just pick a point off the variety. Okay, but same, same difference. Pick the origin and pretend it's not on the variety. Subvariety, okay? Dimension less than three, because we're trying to say that there's none of, no chow in dimension less than top dimension. Okay, so you have a smaller dimensional variety in here. It's not going to fill up the whole variety, uh, A3. Take a point off of it, and then you, you do this. You blow, you, you huff, and you puff, and you blow the Y down. From, do you remember from childhood that uh, story? You just blow air. Blow that variety away. Not by the hair of my chinny chin chin. That is the technique. What do I mean? You apply scaling action. That's what blowing, right? Scale by, let's do scalar multiplication away from the origin. That scalars are like a copy of A1, right? So you apply, apply scaling action. And then you take the limit of the variety when T approaches infinity, the scalar. Look at end result when t equals infinity, the point at infinity on uh, p1. So the p1 is to be thought of as um, gm of scaling. Zero is another point that's missing, but I want you to focus on the infinity point on p1 and ask, what's the variety at infinity? I guarantee you, you cannot find a single location where Y will be. Y is not in affine space anymore. Because if it were, you know, 300 miles away, that would mean that when, you're, when I reverse scalar multiplied by 300, scalar, it would be back in uh, t equals uh, infinity over 300 t it'd be a finite t does that make sense just think about it you're not scaling by a finite amount anymore you're scaling by you take the scalar and run it up to infinity it just gets plastered out beyond the cosmic microwave background radiation it's not in affine space anymore. It's an empty variety. That yes, makes sense? Science. Yeah. So every variety can just been, can be like squirted away into oblivion. It's nowhere, exactly. Now you might say, hold on, hold on. It is somewhere because it goes out and it leaves like a, every point is leaving a direction out there and and it goes and becomes some constellation that's beyond reach 
you're you're actually working in P3, my friend. And you're talking about the hyperplane at infinity. That's where the constellations are. Okay? But we are we have X as A3. And so indeed the limit of this variety ends up in the hyperplane at infinity, um, if you're if you're curious. Alright? But that's the fundamental reason why um, affine space has a very boring chow ring. Varieties can escape out of view from your affine space perspective um, with a parameter that's just a real num a, a rational number line. All right, so that's that's the explanation for why A3 has uh, trivial chop. But of course, uh, newcomers will not like that, and we'll have to write this in a family with in the product A3 over P1. But he, Joe does it perfectly in the book. Go read it. But that's the idea. Okay? Yes, but A... Exactly, A3. I mean, AC. Why does this argument fail for the full AN? Because I couldn't... I, which point am I gonna... Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> you can't... Yeah, you can't... Yeah. Right. But, 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 <laughs> yeah, the problem, it's a problem, a AC, exactly. Okay, so affine spaces, uh, we say it's got a trivial chow group, even though um, it's not trivial because it has that top, um, top degree uh, piece, but every variety is going to have that fundamental class. So that's, that's, that's silly. And this is part of a general theme you should think of as, Affine spaces are kind of like um, contractible spaces in topology. They were mostly just harmless and just there for no real reason. Just shrink them down and, and, and life is good. Like that. Affine spaces are like that. Now, please understand, affine space is not the same word as affine variety. There will be affine varieties that have interesting chow rings. Okay? Good. Yeah, and AC, remember, scaling away by, um, yeah, exactly. You're exactly right. Exactly right. 100%. Twitch Let's Go is here. Welcome. Did you guys know that Twitch Let's Go... And did you go, did you know that I didn't turn the lights on? I know that because it's dark in here. Alright. Twitch Let's Go is, uh, is, is a really great chess streamer. And math people really like chess. So you're in good company. Twitch Let's Go. Now, I know nothing about chess. So there's that. Okay. Um, credits. Vixen, you want me to juggle? I'll juggle in a second. Oh! Uh, whenever I play chess, I like to be the castle. Wow, we've got Twitch Let's Go. You see what you're up against here? You need to educate Cosmic Star Dream. You need to tell them that it's not, you don't choose a character in the beginning. Twitch Let's Go, please, please help my chat. They think you can just choose the character like a game. Another chow ring after credits. We should do projective space completely. All projective spaces. All intermediate dimensions. We should do that at some point. But not right now because the explanation is going to be in, uh, just a little bit involved. We're going to learn one tool called um, excision. And another one called Meyer via Torus. 
sound familiar? Yeah, you should think of Chow, Chow as a algebraic geometer's attempt at a homology or with, when you have the ring structure as a cohomology theory. Okay, so we're going to call things by what they're trying to be. All right. Wait, what do you mean? What about local cohomology? I don't know what you, what, I don't know. Is that a question? Okay, I like to be the red circle pieces when playing chess. I like to be the red circle pieces when playing chess. Shmonite? Shmonite, you're in the credits. Who was that? Who was that? Who was that clown? Cosmic Star Dream. Funny. Very funny. It was funny, Shmonad. It was a good, it was solid C. They have, my we to define an algebraic geometry. Is that an attempt? Yeah. 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 All, the, okay. All the times then when people say Meyer via Taurus sequence, it's like mimicking what you learned in your first topology class. The first Maya via Taurus sequence from ancient Egypt or wherever Maya and via Taurus are from. Okay? That's what I mean. Attempt. Okay. And it's not going to just be here. It's going to be in very uh, all sorts of other places. Um, LBW is here. It has a massive, wrote a massive novel. So we now saw Chow Ring of AN, and we talked about Chow Ring of the products. Can you talk about Chow Ring of vector bundles or line bundles? Maybe one more Chow Ring should be tautological line bundle on projective space. Okay, it turns out that a Chow Ring of a variety and a Chow Ring of a vector bundle over it are isomorphic. Be now, what we're going to build next week, not build, we're not building any of this. What we're going to witness next week or learn about is, you know, when, you taught, when you're taught homology, when you have a map from one space to another, you can push classes forward. You can, you get maps forward on homology and backwards on cohomology. So we're basically going to mimic those. There's going to be an operation called pushing forward along a morphism, pulling back along a morphism. And uh, the vector bundle has a map down to the variety. And the claim is that the pullback map on Chow is an isomorphism. So it doesn't change the Chow ring. And it kind of makes sense because the affine spaces they contribute very little to Chow. You see that? I'm pointing here. I'm pointing at the book, but... Uh, see that? And you've got these vectory spaces. You've got basically affine space across the base. Basically, on open sets. And that's the secret. To use the decomposition as products and Meyer via Taurus. Uh, sorry, and excision to uh, prove this isomorphism on Chow. Okay? So it's actually, I actually answered that question. You now know so many Chow groups, Ch Chow rings. Uh, uh, you know infinitely many now because PN, choose any vector bundle, any line bundle over it. Wonderful. I didn't learn that in my first topology class and still have no idea what that, what that is. Don't worry. Wow. Uh, things, there's an osmosis phenomenon when learning math. You'll see it, you'll see it more and more. And then suddenly you'll feel like, how did I 
When did I? When exactly did I learn this? This sort of happened. All right, yeah, Cosmic Stardom, you're in the credits. How do you feel? That's what people come here for. Twitch, let's go. I don't know if you actually meant to comment, but I did not forget you. I was gonna write you right here. Don't worry. Here you go. Don't worry. This chat, man. This chat. You want juggling, Vixen. Okay, Vixen is here. Everyone, Vixen is here. All the Australians are here. Okay, there is your attention for the day. Hope it feels good. Luo is here. Psych Queen is here. Go check out Psych Queen if you haven't. Another ed educator on Twitch. Internet broke down? Really? I can see some of you. I can see what you just wrote, Luo. And I'm very sorry if I'm I'm not pronouncing your name right. Uh, I, I have grown up with people butchering my name, and I don't mean to do it. But I, I'm calling people random things in their tags, like Psych and Schmonight and, and Algebraically Challenged. I mean... Okay. Mega was here. Mega, try to understand that if... Try to piece it together from this. And, and a linear algebraic group is a rational variety. Okay? That means that it is birational to an affine space. If you know that bit of information, then, then you have enough to answer your question. Okay, so try that. Try that. Um, um, and we can talk about it on the Discord. What were you spacing? I don't know what you were spacing at. No, no, Twitch, let's go. No, no, no. Discord is for mature audiences only. It is rated X. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay, so juggling. I gotta juggle. Uh... You're being scaled up to infinity. Okay. Um, I hope you're in projective space so that you survive. Now, um, uh, let's see. I don't think I want to juggle with um, uh, gambling uh, our channel points. Because I have been struggling with that. I know, I know. Isn't it crazy, Twitch? Let's go. It's universal. I'm sorry. That's actually, uh, when you get your PhD, they want to see if you're ready to become a professor. So they ask you to roast the committee. That's actually the hardest part of the defense. You just have to make fun of them uh, for like 20 minutes each. Um, so that's, pro that's the reason that that happens. Twitch, let's go. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay, ready? Um, uh, I'm, we're not going to gamble. I have not been getting close to the 20 mark. That's because I stopped practicing. I used to. Go check the videos. But this time, I'm just going to do some three ball juggling. You can. And Baldur should try it. Yeah, you should try it. You should try it. Um, it's a, it's a, it's an experience. It's an experience for sure. Okay, ready? Here we go. Chow group. Very general. Chow ring. 
smooth varieties. And it's a miracle that the dream assignment actually extends to a ring structure on rational equivalence classes. Think of the possibilities of utility. Just think about it. Think about Bezu's theorem. Oh, two complicated curves? Uh uh Bunch of lines. You see? We're gonna use that. We're gonna use that power to solve enumerative problems. Oh, complicated intersection? Mm -mm. Use some bubbles. Simple. All right. It's a uh, capital C, I think. Yeah. Uh, some grammar mistake, uh, Vixen. All right, we've got our um, our moderation team. Was uh, Arbitry here? They're usually here. Kevin is here. Kevin, fellow math educator. Good job. Hope you haven't gone insane yet. Uh, any question? Sure. Um, but no, not really. But go ahead. What, what, what do you want? Five shot. Five shot 97. Preferably uh, related to our seminar. Why is matrix calculus not taught in... Okay, some uh, sociol... It's a so sociology question? A sociologist. Okay. Okay. Why is matrix calculus not taught in undergrad? Because it seems to be very important to all modern research. Oh, and pedagogy. Um, but it is uh, five shot um, if by matrix calculus you mean linear algebra linear algebra is like a must do requirement for like all of stem I don't know but like lots of stem if that's what you mean by matrix calculus you know how matrices work when you do this transpose this and that and then do 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 that's linear algebra. I just taught one course of linear algebra. <laughs> no. Uh, po Popo. Popo F629. Oh. Is that what you mean, five shot? Linear algebra? Linear algebra is taught in undergrad like crazy. You mean derivatives? Oh, you mean. Oh. You mean um, calculus of. Uh, several variables Several variable calculus Yeah, um, that's a good question. That's a good question, but um, It's uh, yeah, I know what you mean several variable calculus like um, um, Okay, there's so what it's it is taught in undergrad But what's usually the case is that there's like a calc 3 which is basically only three variable, two variable calculus. Everywhere I've ever seen, mostly. If they do a several variable more than that, it's a very simple problem, usually. Okay? But then, for like math major -y type people who have more interest in, in the topic, there's usually a class that's just called advanced calculus. This is my impression. And I think you're looking for the advanced calculus class where they talk about more general maps between RN and RM. Um, and then you're, 
basically thinking about the Jacobian of that map. That's the only matrix that I can really um, think would be. Uh, but only the R1. Exactly. Um, exactly. So I think advanced calculus, advanced multivariable calculus or something. I don't know. Sometimes advanced calculus just becomes a, um, uh, an analysis class. And then, then it's not what I'm talking about. But you're right. That, that, that's, that's not core curriculum usually. Um, yeah. And it should be, it should be, it should be fluency with maps from RN to RM rather than just R1. I think that should be, um, more emphasized somehow, somewhere. I don't know where though, because the curriculum's already kind of crammed. Uh, believe me, we have to like, yeah. Making changes to uh, a major. Let me explain something at, at, a, at a public school and I'm sure it's similar, but no public school, S big state schools. You want to make, oh, you want to make a change to the major? Oh, five shot. You want to change the major? Oh, wow. That's nice. Hey, come over here. Come over here, five shot. Here's our major that we have developed over 40 years. Um, we have to hit these things. So that takes up this many credits. Okay. Oh, you want to sneak a class in there? All right, uh, it's got to be a 0.5 credit class because that's all we have. Oh, you want to increase the major load? Hold on. Let me call the damn governor because we're going to have to get that passed through the legislature. I'm not, I'm not even joking. Like you, you, you ask for a change. It goes up to the next committee. Then it goes up to another one. We're paid double, then double it's exponential. And then it goes to Congress or something. And they have some random people. They're not professors. Random people sign off on it. Okay, five shot. So here's what we got to do, five shot. You run for Congress. Okay. You will do it two pronged. I'll do it from my end. You go from the other side and we meet in the middle. No, I didn't. Uh, I don't have links uh, uh, enabled, but I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Five shot. I think I know what you mean. Um, yeah, exactly. Okay, Fand is here. Everyone, hold on. Everyone, did you know? I need to come up with a different shout out uh, thing. Okay. Did you know that Fand is very talented, really, really good at Diablo? There you go. Okay, it might not be called advanced calculus, but it's it's the actual advanced multivariable calculus, like multivariable input and output. I believe that's basically what's being talked about here. Pale blue zebra. I see you. You were not quiet. And you know why you weren't quiet, Pale Blue? Do you know the Psycho... Psych Queen is here, but do you know the underlying psychological reasons why you decided to type just now? It is the desire for attention. Feel the sensation in your cerebral hypothalamus 
Feel that? Yes, science! That's why. Okay. Let's go. Let's get out of here. I gotta go, folks. Oh my god. Yeah. Someone's calling me. Um, I'm a really popular guy. I gotta get going. So it was great. I'll see you all Monday in this seminar. Thank you for following in the last second. Uh, trying to get into the credits. And that is really messed up. Some people. Can you believe that? It, can you check out the hypothalamus on this guy? All right, so let's go. Let's get out of here. Um, how will we get out of here? Yeah. B okay, BPS is yeah. BPS is my brother, so that's that's different. This is different. This doesn't count. This is. Okay, I'm I'm not even gonna try. And, and okay, I'm just I'm now they're just gonna be signatures. Okay? They're only signatures from here on. Um, no more. So who are we gonna raid? This other screen is very far. Okay, anyone have a suggestion? Uh, any educational streamers out there right now? Uh, try... Hey, is Megalomorph on? Yeah, Megalomorph. Let's just dump you in Megalomorph's chat, okay? I'm not going to stick around, but go troll Megalomorph. All right, go troll Megalomorph real fast. All right, see you guys Monday. Um, wait, I can't raid yet. I'll just start waving. All right, I'll see you guys on Monday. Some of you I'll see uh, earlier than that. Have fun. Think about the chow ring of A-N. All right.